I was pleased that he was going to be able to be here too. Thank you, Doris. It's a real privilege for me to be here at this ladies' meeting tonight. <laughs> Some of you escaped from the circus. I see you got beards. <clears throat> I'm glad to be here with Brother Paulson and our Vice President Fingston. I used to kid Fingston that we belong to a very chintzy organization because he was the only vice president. He, in other words, there was only one. Usually big organizations have several. Fingston was just one first vice president. He never even used it. He just said vice president. I can't help but recollect Brother Paulson when I last saw him. He travels a lot. And sometimes he gets into sort of almost unnerving situation during his travels. He came home one night after an excursion and he looked all bushed, absolutely tired out, and his wife asked, wife asked him, where in the world were you? This is a lie. <laughs> <laughs> you notice any culprit when confronted with the truth will proclaim it to be a lie. Brother Paulson came home absolutely tuckered out, and his wife finally got out on why he was so tired. Said, I was at that hotel in St. Louis, and so help me, I didn't get to sleep till 4 o'clock this morning. And she says, why was that, Arnold? Why? He says, there was a woman banging on that hotel door all night long. And she says, what finally happened? How would you finally get to sleep? Well, he says, I finally got out of bed and let her out. Twice a week, huh? <laughs> well, I wonder if you folks would just like to stand up once, because I know Fingston's got a long uh, speech to deliver, and I got about five minutes, but maybe you want to stand up and stretch a little bit, and shake hands with the guy next door to you, and introduce yourselves. Go is it okay for guys to kiss each other? Can you tell that he's a part-time Baptist preacher, you know? <laughs> See, Orly just came in. Why don't we ask him if he wants to say no. a few words? You want to do it? Yeah, I'll do that. Okay, maybe we're stretching up. Our illustrious president is standing over there by the door. Orly, would you like to say a few words? I just sneaked in to, to listen and enjoy, you know. So I'll just take three minutes, maybe five. <laughs> no, all I want to say here tonight is that I believe this is a convention that we've worked for for a long time. That we've put pieces together to get to where that we could do what had to be done for the farmers of this country. I can go before the farmers in almost any area and say that now our members, almost without exception, are getting the best prices available to farmers anywhere. That our cattle program and slaughter cattle, I don't think anybody can equal it. We're almost in the same position in hogs, and we've got a lot of spots in grain. 
And we're getting it done because of the service that we're performing for the companies, the deliveries that we're making, and the professionalism that we've added to help us do some things we didn't know. And I believe that that's almost without exception. And where there are exceptions, there's one thing. If we can do it in most of the areas, and it's not being done in a few areas, there's one reason, and that's volume. You still can't bargain with an empty bucket or a wheelbarrow full. And if we're doing it and you go to the delegates and visit with them here, you're going to find out their personal experiences. The August 3rd meeting should never have been held if we didn't mean business by March 1st. We should have never made that public commitment. I urged it, I supported it, and I'm willing to fight to get it there with the help of a lot of other people. And the only thing that I'm doing tonight, I want to say one other thing without going over my time. Stop the clock for a moment. But the, going, but the one thing that I think, we have got two echelons or stratas of economics in agriculture right now. Never happened before. And that is that it's always was necessary for the people that till the land to scrape every penny they could together until they were so feeble they couldn't work any longer and they hoped they had enough to pay their doctor bills, live out the rest of their life in some comfort with enough food and have enough money to bury themselves. Today, we've got farmers, almost all of them, over 45, that bought their land when it was cheap and it's worth five, six, eight times as much as when they bought it. They bought their equipment, which is worth more too or not worth any less, and they feel awful comfortable. And then we've got the young farmers that have bought some of that land, have bought the new equipment, had to to farm any volume, and they've got their backs to the wall because their cash flow will not equal their expenses. And today there's only one program in this nation not even another idea, to my knowledge, and certainly not with any structure or the professional help or professional know-how and with a structure nationwide to deliver the products that could even have a glimmer of hopes of saying to the farmers, you've got a chance for cost of production plus reasonable profit contracts for the first day of March. You know, we've had a lot of conventions when everybody went out stomping, yelling, holding up their hands, pledging. And soon it was lost because you couldn't identify anybody. Intentions were good. This year, it must be different. And this piece of paper is what's going to make it different because we're going to find out who wants to stand up and be counted and who wants to commit firmly. Because this first one is your signature, your telephone number, your address. And then there's a blank for five people's names, their estimated production, their address and telephone number if possible, that you're going to commit in the next two weeks to try to get them to move their production with you. And we're asking one thing, don't put down names that you've already contacted 10 times. We want you to put down the names of people that have not been contacted in, at least in a year. We've got to broaden our base. But don't put it down because we're going to have your telephone number, you know, other people are gonna have it, and your commitment. And if you don't get none of the first five, you know what? You have to come up with five more names until you get five. 
I believe the thing that has really kept the NFO going, two things, a need, and the other was a desire to win. We've already won enough points of great contribution from the organization. But I think most of us want to win because of the need, but probably equally as much that desire to go the full route. And this is our convention's chance. The programs are better than I thought they would ever be until we got to the master contract position. Nothing that I can do by myself, but something that all of us can achieve. The companies have already signed enough contracts, every, almost every major company in this country. Not just one, or one commodity. I've got in my pocket right here a contract that includes many of the terms that we were working on the master contract, thank you, saw it last night. Many of those terms that we sought the biggest company in that commodity. So all I can say is, I've taken enough time. I'm glad to see this array of speakers. I always wanted to pull Kenerva out of a mud hole some way, and I'm sure he was in it. <laughs> and now I'm glad to say, let's go get it, and let's tie it down by March 1st. Thank you. Thank you. All right. <laughs> It's something else I want to say. It's great to see Earhart Finkston on the speaking line. He probably has a new quip, you know, now and then. And I want to extend a sincere appreciation to Red Paulson to be with us tonight, too, Red. Because he has given all the energy that he could have. You know, it's a tough road convincing people to help themselves. He's been part of that. Glad to see all of you. I knew we were having such a good time that it was going to carry down the hall and all of the folks that wanted to crowd was going to come up here. <laughs> They'll have to charge us more. We're having more fun. Come on, Oren. Oris, let's try to, try to give her one more go. You know, I, <laughs> I don't know if this is fair or not if he gets to start twice. <laughs> Okay, here we go, part two. <laughs> Doris wasn't kidding. I am no longer farming, although I did farm for many, many years, and worked for the National Farmers Organization, and still do, during the winter months. I'm a consumer. And I'm glad to be here and finally find out who it is that's causing all the inflation. Because <laughs> you're the people that are doing it. I read the papers every day. Since food costs went up, reason, farm prices climbed. I see that every day. So I'm glad to be here. I could further tell that this was the right place and the right city and the right hotel for the farm convention. Because when I got in my room, I saw a big plaque on the wall that says, this room equipped to handle handicapped. I simply cannot understand the thinking that farmers engage in. I've done it myself. I've talked to a lot of farmers. And it always comes up a big question mark. Why is it so difficult, as Orrin Lee put it, to get somebody to help themselves? Collective bargaining works. It works in all walks of life. It has worked in my life. For many decades, I've carried here in my back pocket, next to my heart, a bricklayer's <laughs> union card, which has served me well. I call it the mortgage lifter. <laughs> and it works. 
It guarantees me a reasonably good wage. Not as good as Red Paulson, but pretty good. <laughs> it works in many, many walks of life. You and I are paying through the nose right this very day because of collective bargaining. You know, back before 1973, you know how much the OPEC countries were getting for oil? When the Arabian oil fields were first developed, the Arabian oil people, Saudi Arabian government, from the Aramco, Aramco Corporation collected 60 cents a barrel for crude oil. Now, we always had thought that the Arabs weren't the most intelligent people, and some of us even called them ragheads because they wore those turbans, you know. But those people sent their smartest guys over to U.S. to study business administration. They didn't send them to agricultural colleges, by the way. <laughs> and they studied business administration. They went home and they took stock of the situation and found that they were sitting on the biggest known reserves of crude oil in the world. Remind you of anything? The biggest known reserves of food or grain in the world. You ever hear of that? That's why you don't, can't get a price. But you know, the Arabs wouldn't believe that. They formed an organization called OPEC, and they told Aramco Corporation, we want price for our production. And Aramco said, well, yeah, I think you're right. We've only been paying you 60 cents. Tell you what we're going to do. We'll give you twice as much, which ought to be very acceptable. And you know what the Arabs told them? They didn't say a thing. They just used a certain sign. Matter of fact, they only used half of the peace sign for them. <laughs> And you know what worked? <laughs> Not did they get 60 cents a barrel, they got $6. <laughs> and $7, and $8, and $10, and $11, and now they're talking about raising it some more. What do we do? You have the largest known reserve of grains in the world, and what do we do? We had a group of people from the largest farm organization in this country went to China to talk to the people that buy grain from us to find out how much they were willing to pay. Boy. <laughs> You've heard it said you can't organize farmers? And still we have an organization that claims that it has 115% of all the farmers in its ranks. <laughs> you ever think of that? 2.8% million members and there's only 2.6 million farmers? That's good going. Well, why is it so difficult to get farmers to realize? When I came here this afternoon and realized I was at a farm convention, I went out and wandered around looking to see where all the NFO people were because I figured there'd be about 80,000 of them out here, but it turned out they were all at meetings. So I went down to this exhibit over here where they sell all these big tractors. And there was a group of ladies down there doing quite a lot of talking. And I kind of hung around the outskirts because I'm scared of ladies. <laughs> and I heard them explaining the farm situation to those who were willing to listen. Turned out they were people from the American agricultural movement. They were explaining to the consuming public why farmers needed more money. You know a curious thing? I didn't see one lady who claimed to be the wife of one of the tractor salesmen out there asking the consuming public for more money. And I noticed another thing. There were price tags on those tractors. You know, I drove one of our trucks. I'm in the construction business. And I figured this organization had progressed far enough that I could safely do this. I drove one of our trucks down, and I've got the product that you people need. I've got little stamps and little pieces of paper. that You stamp the price, and then you put it on your product. And I'll sell you those stamps and those pieces of paper as we leave the convention, because you're going to need them. <laughs> now, 
Getting back to why is it so difficult? Do you people recognize that you have the power to control your own destiny? I get all the information that's sent out from the NFO office. I read the last leader's letter, and it made me mad. It just made me mad as can be. It made me almost sorry that I had ever become involved in this organization to realize that a letter like that had to be sent out. I'm glad it was sent out. It took courage to send it out. To tell you people point blank that you've got the best organization that the agricultural scene can offer. You've got professional people working for you, and then in between the lines you could read, please participate. I almost feel like going out and going one by one, says here's five reasons why you should participate. <laughs> you could probably understand that a lot better. You know, the whole situation reminds me of a of a chicken farmer who had 30,000 hens and the rooster was gay. <laughs> you can't get much production that way. <laughs> now, did you people come to this convention, and only some, the, the objectives of this convention, did you come here thinking like a man did who read the Kalamazoo Gazette and in there he saw an ad says, there will be a lecture on schizophrenia at such and such a hall at Western Michigan University. And the guy thought to himself, I got half a mind to go. You came here to learn, did you not? You came here to participate. You came here to move one step closer to that goal that we've all chased. Now, you've come much closer to it. You have an organization, one that's ready, willing, and able to work for you. And you've also found out that it's a much bigger job than you thought it was originally, have you not? You certainly have. I don't know who this quote is from, but it is a quote. It says, the larger the island of knowledge grows, the wider is its shoreline of mystery. Think about it. And we have learned much about human nature. We've learned much about farmers. We've learned much about the mystery that surrounds this small no island of knowledge. You know what the university professors are telling the students now? That the family farm is an anachronism, a prehistoric monster that eventually would, will phase itself out and we'll have corporate agriculture and that you folks are on your way out. The attrition rate is about three to three and a half percent per year. It grinds on. Nobody has stopped it but it can be stopped. Do you want to be an anachronism? Doris mentioned that I was a part-time Baptist minister. This is not true. <laughs> but I would like to quote something from the Bible that you, some of you might think is out of context, but I think it's very, very applicable. It's from the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, where it says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And I recently read a study on the Sermon on the Mount and gained some tremendous insights. What comes to mind when you hear the word meek? Rhymes with weak, doesn't it? And you'll sit down and be a floor mat that people can walk over you. That is not what it means. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Football players are meek in the sense that they will subject themselves to discipline and will do what is necessary to win. And as I see it, the problem with the farmer today is that he is 
not meek in the sense that he is willing to discipline himself and sell together with his fellow man. He'd rather go out and knock his fellow man out of the box in a competitive effort to outproduce him and to undermine him. Am I right? So let us become meek. Let's be willing to subject ourselves to the discipline necessary to belong to an organization that's willing to go out and do a job and you be a part of it and you need not become an anachronism. We can do as Red Paulson pointed out, we can be the solution for those economic problems that beset us, but only if we're willing to take the step that's necessary and I, I like the statement, bless are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. You already have the earth, you and the banker. <laughs> Become a disciplined group of people and get more people involved and you can indeed become economically successful. Thank you. Thank you, Oris. You see, if, if you make enough phone calls and you get this kind of a bunch lined up, you don't have to say much as a master of ceremony. Now, I suppose I've, I've bugged the feminists. I should say person. <laughs> I am more interested in farmers' lib. Uh, I think that Mr. Fingston is known to everybody in here unless you just joined recently and then I'm sure you've heard of him. He was one of the first pioneers who came up in our direction anyway to organize and it seems to me that the main difference now as we look at young guys like Comac there, the pioneers that started this thing have put us in a position where we are now able to do what we set out to do. And we didn't build it for nothing. We didn't build it just for us, and we didn't build it to die. We built it to be picked up and gone with the same as the family farm from generation to generation. And Mr. Fingston has done a lot of service for the organization and has retired a few years ago he lied to Irene a couple of times, you know. We heard him from the platform, I'm coming home, you know. Six months later, she's wondering where he's at because he's on the circuit again. Well, he finally decided to make good. <laughs> well, we sweet-talked him out of mothballs two years ago for the women's meeting, and he swore never again. But see, he forgets. See, you let one year lapse, and we talked him into it again this year. <laughs> He said, never again. And I said, okay, but I reserve the right to try. <laughs> he agreed. I would like to ask Mr. Fingston if he would wrap up the meeting for us tonight because I think he can do it better than anybody else. And I, before, before I ask Mr. Fingston to take over, I want to give a commercial because I know you all go want to get someplace else. Thursday, we're going to have two meetings that will be seminar type meetings for the gals and if any of the men are interested they can come too. We're going to talk about communications improvements and publicity improvements and we will have some members that are doing things in the country that will be talking to us and telling us how, it's, how they've done it and give us some ideas. And I would hope that whatever Fink leaves with you tonight that that will be some thoughts that you will bring over with you into the convention Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. It seems to me like the biggest difference. Mr. Staley said 23 years he's looked for this convention. Well, I haven't been at it that long, but this is the one I've looked for since we've been members. And there's some other Traverse County people here who we chartered in 63, and we wanted, we wanted to get to the place where we could do it. And as far as I'm concerned, this is the first time we've had a chance to do what we threatened and set out to do. And there's no place to go now other than production. Every other year we've had 
a little more brick to put in place, a little more program here, a little more professionalism there. There's no place to go right now but production. We either go with it, we improve it, or we slide backwards. We don't have any more busy work. We don't have any more excuses. We don't have any more directions to go except production. And if the volume is not there, the programs won't be satisfactory. I'll guarantee you if the volume is there, the programs will be satisfactory. And I think, Mr. Finkston, if you will honor us, sir, I'd like to have you do the wrap-up. For the benefit of the new members that uh, weren't around when I used to do a lot of speaking in order to clear things up and help you understand what's going on, uh, I want to explain that applause. The word got out that I wasn't going to talk very long. <laughs> and then again, when I hear Doris's reference to the ladies' meeting, Having spoken at the ladies' meeting two years ago and looking over the crowd tonight, I come to the conclusion that Anita Bryan hasn't hurt the gay movement a bit. <laughs> so, ladies and whatever, <laughs> there's a lot of chairs over here. Doris wanted you to know you can come over and sit down. But it is a pleasure, always has been for me, to follow somebody like Mr. Paulson who could lay a financial background that people could understand and give us a realization of what actually is happening. And I'm certainly glad that he was ahead of me tonight because it's going to save me a lot of explaining. And there's a few comments I'd like to make in connection with what he says, and we'll use them through what I say. One thing that I'd like to say at the very outset, that in this nation, in almost all cases, where something extremely good has been done for people, it was done for the wrong reason. And I'm wondering whether that might not be the case with what we're doing in our organization. Whether maybe out of our concern for ourselves and our own operation or preservation of our own operation, whether we're not doing it for the wrong reason or doing the good for the wrong reason. And that's the preservation of our entire nation. He gave you the outlook on how many years we've got to go, which is six and a half, till there be absolutely no more money. But don't you ever kid yourself, you're not going to that sixth year. It's gonna collapse long before unless that we do do our job, whether it's for the right reason or the wrong reason. I think the welfare of the nation lies with NFO. Now, I told you my talk's going to be short, and it is. Sort of a Reader's Digest thing. Condense a lot of words in little tiny thoughts or at least cut her short. The things that I used to talk about, three things that I thought had to be explained before we could move. The condition that we were in, how we got there, and what we're going to do to get ourselves out of it. I think Paulson has done a pretty good job explaining to you the position we're in as a nation, and for that matter, as individuals. The farm situation really hasn't changed. That's pretty much as it always was. 
So I can sum that up real fast. One word. Lousy. How's that for condensing? <laughs> but maybe it does need a little bit of explanation. Because there are too many people that do believe that they're doing fine. We're hearing the beef prices condemned continuously every night. I hear it on the news. I hear the news three times a day. And I don't believe that it ever, there ever passes a day where farm prices don't get hit or food prices is the cause of all the problems in the United States. So if you don't think the propaganda forces haven't been lined up to see to it that you don't get a price, you better think again. Because that doesn't just happen. That's organized and being done systematically. So some of our farmers think because of, say, on the television and radio that these beef prices are high, that they're doing fine. So I don't buy that. In no way. You're going to tell me, and a gentleman in this room told me just a little while ago that in this state that a feeder movement moved the cattle out for 76 cents a pound are you going to tell me that the cattle feeder buying feeder cattle for 76 cents and selling them for 56 cents is in a good condition? Now here's something for the efficient guy to get his, his teeth into. You know, we hear that. That's all you need to do is get efficient, watch for the opportunity and seize it when it comes by. Now here's your opportunity on cattle. You know you can't make any money buying 76 cent cattle and selling them fat for 52 to 56. So if you're really efficient, buy the fat cattle and thin them down. Now would also come under the heading of a low-cost operation. <laughs> if you're making money at all, it's because the grain prices are terrible. But the grain men don't realize either they're in trouble. They just got through harvesting. My area, they're just proud as it could be. We had a number of years of drought. And this year we had one of the biggest crops on record. But they haven't been sold yet. See, they're on the bins and we're going to wait till next year after the first of the year on account of income tax. So if we put the pencil to it, the price has dropped since we were in the drought when we had a failure big drop in price, costs have terrifically increased, and when you put a pencil to it, we had another failure, a failure with the biggest crop in history. That's right. But I know what I'm going to hear next spring, March, April, I circulate among the farmers. Well, I'm pretty lucky this year. I don't have to pay any income tax. <laughs> and they actually think they are lucky. That's when they'll find out where they got to this year or what happened. So the condition is terrible out there. Lousy is the word. That's as far as I'll go with that one. But I do believe when we get to the proposition of how did we get there, over the period of many years that I did the talking, I used to tell a story that became almost my trademark. It went over so big and seemed to explain it so well that long after I just got sick and tired of that story, no matter where I went, there would be members there that tell me, be sure and tell the jackass story. <laughs> because they had some non-members in the meeting and, 
They thought it maybe it'd do them good <laughs> to hear it. Well, in order again to remind you of how we got into the mess that we're in, I'm going to tell that story. <laughs> now, if you've heard it, don't interrupt me because I want to hear it again myself. <laughs> but anyway, I was born and raised in an area that was predominantly a wheat producing area. Now, I'm getting long in years. Two weeks, I'll be 69 years old. See, so you figure this is quite a while ago. It's about when I was 10 years old, so let's say 59 years ago. It was a wheat producing area, as I said, and in those days we didn't have trucks to haul our grain, so naturally when we harvested, we couldn't move it fast enough to the market. So we unloaded it on the farm, put it in bins and granaries, and then hauled it out in the spring and the winter of season when we had nothing else to do. Now we lived four miles from a country elevator, totally in the country. All that was there was, of course, the railroad track going through, the elevator, a depot, and an old time country store. No highway, wasn't even on a highway. So in spring, we'd start and we'd haul the wheat to this little elevator four miles away. And at that time we had the 50 bushel box, wagon box, held 50 bushel. Rounded them up real good and high, get on about 55 bushel. Well, we'd haul a load in the forenoon and we'd haul a load in the afternoon. And on about the same day that or time that we started hauling our wheat, our neighbors started hauling his. And he had one of these faithful old teams of mules, a team that once they knew what you wanted them to do, they'd do it automatically. Now, some of you are old enough, you might, might remember when your dads had teams like that. Well, this is a team that this neighbor used to haul that wheat. And we see him go by with a load of wheat in the forenoon. We'd see him go by again with another load in the afternoon. And this kept up for about two, three days. Long about the third or fourth day, here came this team of mules from home, headed toward town with a full load of wheat on the wagon, but no driver. <laughs> Long about 10.30 or 11 o'clock, there they were coming back from town, going home, this time with an empty wagon, but still no driver. About one o'clock, lo well, and behold, there they were, coming back again, going to town, another load of wheat, but still no driver. Well, my dad didn't like that very well. My brother and I were driving our teams, and we were 10 and 12 years old. My dad said that's pretty dangerous, having that team out there on the road unattended. So he went over to this neighbor to have a talk with him about it. When he got there, he said, Fred, don't you think that that's pretty risky business, sending those mules to the market with that wheat by themselves? The old neighbor looked down and feet in front of him, didn't say anything finally. He said, no, Henry, I don't think that that's dangerous. He said, you know, I went with them myself the first couple of days and I didn't get a cent more for that wheat than those jackasses are gotten. Please turn the tape over to side number two.